and welcome to another edition of the Food and Farm Show. I'm Cheryl Noble. And I'm Gil Dominguez. As you can see behind us, the Food and Farm Show is on location today at the Briar Patch Community Co-op, which is the only food co-op in Nevada County. Yes, and they're also growing to be one of the largest food co-ops in this country, due in part to the growing awareness of consumers' demand to eat fresh, local, and organic food. Their mission is to provide organic food with a local focus and to be a community hub and a source of education about food issues. Later in the show, we'll talk with store manager Chris Mayer and learn all about the Briar Patch Food Co-op. Also on today's program, we will have part two of Master Gardener Lynn Muth's Spring Plant Workshop. We'll also go to North San Juan to the Seed Swap and learn a little bit about Felix Gillet, who was the Frenchman who came over here and has left his mark on our local agricultural scene. Be sure to watch us every week, Monday nights at 6.30 on the Food and Farm Show which is on NCTV Channel 11 and Sunlink 16 and ACTV Channel 20. You can also find us on the YouTube channel, which is the Food and Farm Show channel. We're also on Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest, so get in the conversation and share your stories and your photos and experiences. And you can also just simply go to our website and get all of this information quick and easily. That is thefoodandfarmshow.com. So we have a lot more ahead here on this episode of the Food and Farm Show. Time for our first break of the day. When we come back, we'll be going to A to Z Garden Center with Lynn Muth on spring planting. You're watching the Food and Farm Show right here on the Touchdown Productions Network. Introducing Cuvée Leather Kitchenware. Kitchenware that lasts a lifetime. Made from genuine leather suede, Cuvée Kitchenware comes in a variety of colors and has been featured on the Food Network. Leather is the perfect kitchenware. It is a natural insulator, washable, and non-flammable. Cuvée, leather kitchenware, chefware, and tableware. Unique kitchenware to complement your favorite place. Create, entertain, and be you. Anything Green Hydroponics is your source for hydro systems, grow lights, and soils. Anything Green offers a complete range of organic nutrients as well as fungicides, miticides, and predatory bugs. Don't forget the Anything Green Propagation Workshop on Saturday, March 30th from 1 to 2 p.m. Learn how to propagate seed, cutting, and grafting. It's all at Anything Green Hydroponics. Briar Patch Co-op Natural Foods Community Market offers organic produce from over 30 local and regional farms and buys organic produce throughout the year from River Hill, Four Frog, Sweet Roots, Johansson, and Naked Farms. You can trust the patch to hold their producers to the highest standards and always be certified organic. So get to the patch, the Briar Patch, for organic produce. Spring is here. Time to visit the garden center at A to Z Supply. We have everything you need to plant it, grow it, preserve it, and eat it. With a master gardener and full full-time beekeepers on staff, the garden center carries a wide selection of organic plants along with people and pet friendly products. And don't forget our weekly workshops at the garden center at A to Z Supply. Welcome back to the Food and Farm Show. If you were joining us last week, you saw part one of Master Gardener's Lynn Muth's Spring Planting Workshop. Today, we're going to see part two of her workshop, which is presented by the Garden Center at A to Z Hardware. Well, hello and welcome. Welcome to my workshop on early spring vegetables or cool season vegetables. I am Lynn Muth. I am an employee here at A to Z Garden Center. I'm also a master gardener and I have a small landscape business where I do design and consulting and pruning, which I've been doing all winter. So have all of you gardened before? Do you guys have all veggie gardens? Do you have veggie gardens? Do you garden in raised beds? Do you garden in pots? Do you garden in the ground? What? All of the above. All of the above? <laughs> yeah, me too. I haven't had good luck in the ground, even though I augment the soil. 
there are things on that sheet of paper, that single sheet of paper that I gave you, that tells you what you need to work into the, to the clay to get it working. We sell a product called Soil Building Compost. There's three or four different brands of it out there. But the soil building compost has gypsum in it, along with a lot of other nutrients. And the gypsum um, acts like little millions of shovels. It breaks down the clay. And without putting gypsum into your clay soil, you could make pots out of it. In fact, I have before. Yeah, nice red pots. <laughs> so, but just remember, to break down any clay soil, you need gypsum. Okay, and compost. Compost is real, real important. Compost is organic matter that's really going to help any of your soils to be healthier. Um, remember, keep this in mind. If you are gardening in a bed that you gardened in last year, it's just like vitamins. You have to take them every day for them to do any good, right? Well, every time you garden in your raised bed, you need to replenish the nutrients. Now, one way to do it is with soil testing. You can either do it yourself. You can bring it in here. I do it for $5 a, a, a soil test. Dig down six inches, bring me half a cup, or use your own half a cup and test your soil yourself. Without a soil test, you are shooting blind. You don't know what's going on underneath that little crust of dirt. You really need to test your soil. So many people will, oh, I don't need to test it. I'm just going to throw this in there and throw that in there. Well, do you make a cake that way? No, and that's pretty much what you're doing in that soil in there. You are making nice, healthy soil so you can grow nice, healthy plants. If you don't do that, it's kind of a waste of your time. I mean, you can assume that you've already used up all the nitrogen and all the phosphorus. But again, you're wasting your time because you might have put an overabundance in manure in the last year, and it might so still, some of it still be in there. So soil testing is the way to go. I've got some at home right now sitting on my kitchen cabinet, and it's just pure old clay, and the water is the color of his uh, vest right there. It looks like orange juice. Love Nevada County. <laughs> yes? So when we had soil delivered last year, we had an excess, so we covered it with the tarp. Does that also have to be augmented? I would. Yeah. Uh, and particularly where you got it from, some of our soil... So oh, good. Some of our soil brokers are not equal to other soil brokers, and since we're being filmed, I will not be slandering anyone tonight. I don't want a hitman to come and get me. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I would soil test it just to be on the safe side. I soil test all the time. Another thing good about these soil tests, uh, the pH level is really, really, really important. Some vegetables, and this one, this bigger t uh, soil test, has a chart inside that tells you what the pH level requirement for et each vegetable and each fruit is. If you're trying to grow blueberries, how many of you are growing blueberries? Are you, have you had any success? Good. Blueberries need a pH level of 4 point to 6 point. Our soil is typically around 7 point. So if you put blueberries in that soil, what's going to happen? Nothing. Not a darn thing. The plant will eventually die. So pH level is real, real, real important. Uh, a lot of people put uh, coffee grinds into their compost. Be really careful when you do that. Coffee grinds are terribly acidic and they will bring your pH level down just critically. So be really careful with doing that. Do you guys all have compost piles and your little bins and all of that stinking up the neighborhood and yeah, mine's right on this, out by the street. <laughs> I can really smell it. But soil testing, again, really, really important. Um, yes? What do you mean by be careful? How much is being careful? Uh, With your coffee grounds? Yeah. Make sure that you have other things that are going in there. I mean, you know, if you were like my mom and dad who drank three pots of coffee a day, they had an abundance of coffee grounds. That's too much to go into your compost pile. But if you put that in there, then you're going to need to put maybe some alfalfa in it. Make your greens and browns equal to, you know, so that you've got the three mixes. Yeah, that's what I mean. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. In a raised bed, taking, say, a 4 by 8 raised bed, when doing soil testing, do you need to test the various areas of the bed or just one area? Just one area. Down 
Yeah, six inches down. Yeah, I would think so because it's pretty typical. The soil test I was doing, the guy took one sample from the front of his house and the back of his house, and they were exactly the same because it was just the good old clay that we have up here. Yeah, makes great dye, incidentally. Um, yeah, especially if you got white tennis shoes. <laughs> You're either from Georgia or from Nevada County, one or the other, right? <laughs> um, when you're adding uh, nitrogen, let's say, there are all kinds of organic ways that you can go. And I want to caution you on something that I've been uh, getting some bulletins on from UC Davis about manures. Because, because some of the manures are toxic. The E. coli in them is not... Uh, cooked out of them so to say and it lives for a long time and if they are the horses are eating hay that's been treated with any of the nicotinoids which are some really really bad uh, systemic pesticides it goes into the hay and it stays in the hay it does not compost out so be really careful where you get, if you get it from a friend, find out what they feed their horses. Now we did do research on um, the uh, deworming compound that horses are fed and found out that that goes through and does not uh, attach itself to any plant that might be growing in it. So that's not a, anything to be alarmed over. It's just these pesticides that are so prolific right now and uh, so scary. The thing about the neonicotinoids are commonly called neonics. Um, they're in so many products and they're systemic. The main products are systemic and I won't name any companies. You would probably know them if I said them. They go into the plant root. They are pulled up in through the plant. They go into the blossom of the plant. And when the bees fly into the blossom, the pollen is toxic, infecting the bees. They are beginning to link this with colony collapse disorder. It's not going to be the only cause of it, but they're beginning to think that it might be a leading cause of it. What it does, it causes them to, their central nervous system, they lose their sense of direction. They can't find their way back to the hive. Those that do go back to the hive with lowered resistance, they cannot withstand any of the pathogens that are in the hive and they die. So we, had been, we have been called out, I say we as the United States, by the European Federal Safety Agency because of the, test, <clears throat> excuse me, the testing that was done in America by the companies, which I find that strange that you would have the company do the testing. They're not going to rat on themselves. Uh, but they, the European Food Safety Agency called us out on faulty tests and shoddy research work. Yeah. Now, uh, I'm also going to mention a name. You're going to write this down if you haven't already before. I get, my, I, I get these bulletins through my email. Well, I have to check everything out through UC Davis. There's a website called UC, um, IPM. Are you familiar with IPM? Integrated Pest Management. If you garden, you need to be connected. Uh, integrated Pest Management. It's an amazing site. It is so filled of information. When I got this information about these neonicotinoids, I got the names of one of them. One of them is um, Amidacloprid. And I went on the website, went into the section where the pesticides are, and they have a page, and it tells you what the toxicity is to the water, what the toxicity is to human and animals, and what the toxicity is to bees. Well, the amidacloprid is highly toxic to bees. What do you think they put around the almond trees down in the valley? Yeah, amidacloprid. And then the bees are, you know, the bees come from all over the world to go, or all over America to go down into the valley. Yeah, it's, and they've been, these um, neonics have been banned in France. They've been banned in England. They've been banned in Sweden. Have they been banned in America? Of course not. So, I'm sorry, I will get off my soapbox. <laughs> but I, I just am alerting you to this to be aware of when you, if you have to buy a pesticide, read the label and read it thoroughly. We do not, um, we do not dispose of these correctly. We don't use them correctly. We overuse them. Uh, one report I read said that the homeowner uses something like 70 times more pesticide than they need to use. So be cautious. The IPM website will also tell you alternatives to use so that you don't just 
quick go grab that glyphosate or go grab that imidacloprid. They tell you things to do, how to control any pests that you might have, how to use other measures. Like, uh, you know, you see aphids. Oh my goodness, go get the bottles, spray, spray, spray. Did you know you can get rid of aphids? You just blast them with water. So the thing about you need to do is constantly be being monitoring in your garden. If you have an automatic drip system, that kind of keeps you disconnected from your garden because you don't have to worry about watering it. You know, you go out and you collect your tomatoes if you've got them, and you collect your green beans. But if you go out every day, every morning, and look at what's going on in your garden, you're gonna stay ahead of those insects and those pests and those um, hornworms that come in there and wanna eat up everything in your garden. <laughs> And the IPM website will tell you ways that you can help prevent any of these things from attacking your garden and taking it over. I discovered this summer that uh, I had an infestation of spider mites on my French green beans. I was very upset. I went to the IPM website and on that website it told me that spider mites are caused by dusty, dry conditions and that I should water my green beans every morning. Not water the green bean, the plant. I did. I went out in the morning and I went out in the afternoon. I got rid of my spider mites. I thought that was pretty phenomenal because what else was I going to do? Neem oil is fairly safe. So the safer products are pretty good. There are things out there that aren't as toxic as these other things that should be taken off the market. So, okay, yes ma'am. The last dozen years I haven't had the horned worms, but this last year I was... I remember that you were inundated with them. They're in the soil. And did you plant in that same spot the crop that they were on, the tomatoes? Did you plant them there last year? No. Hmm. Interesting. They're in the soil, and there is a product you can use that is uh, non-toxic to humans. It's called BT, short for Bacillus thuringiensis. It only targets caterpillars. You can use that, and it doesn't uh, it won't harm anything else. One thing that I do with tomatoes, I keep them up off the ground. I cut their leaves off about a foot. And when I plant them, I'll cut the bottom out of a one gallon pot and sink that in it, around it into the dirt so they can't craw crawl up. And if you keep the leaves about a foot high, they live on those bottom leaves, so if those leaves are up off the ground and there's a lot of circulation there, you're not so likely to get them, okay? And if you do see them in the daytime, they're always on that bottom, like six inches of the tomato plant, okay? Uh, one good thing about that tomato hornworm, I don't know if you guys know this or not, this kind of the yin and the yang of that awful tomato hornworm, the tomato hornworm is the larvae for the hummingbird moth. And the hummingbird moth, you only see, they only come out at night. If you ever see one, your first thought will be, that's a hummingbird and it's dark. What's it doing out? They're the same size. They're not as colorful, but their, their markings on their wings are absolutely beautiful. They're a very important nighttime pollinator. So if you let any get loose, know that you helped get the hummingbird moth into population. Yeah, and we don't have a lot of nighttime poll poll pollinators, but we do have a lot of flowers that bloom at night that need a pollinator. So something to think about. I call it the yin and yang of it. Um, any questions? How are we doing out there? Um, let me see. Okay. Yes. The um, IPM, is that .org or .com? Just Google IPM UC Davis. It'll pop right up. Okay. Yeah. There's another website that I find really, really enjoyable, and it's an interactive website. It's also out of UC Davis, but it's called CA Garden Web, and that is .org. You can ask them a question and they will, the powers that be, the brains at UC Davis in the Ag Department uh, will be right back at you with an answer. They're amazing. When I do the Saturday morning Master Gardener radio show, I, people call in to ask us questions and we have nothing there but what we brought in with us and what's up here. And uh, we'll have to, we'll refer people to that. I've actually gone home at 2.15 and looked on the CA Garden Web and the person has asked the question and had it answered. And I'm like, yes, I love UC Davis. What's the website at? CAGardenWeb.org. Do you have it on there? Yeah, the IPM is ipm.ucdavis.edu. Thank you.
Don't we love our little devices? <laughs> um, one thing to remember about nitrogen, you can over apply nitrogen and in doing so, um, it attracts a lot of insects when they're highly nitrogenated. It also attracts deer. When you buy a plant, say from us, and you take it home and plant it, it's so loaded with nitrogen, the deer are drawn to it like a magnet. So something to remember, you need to really protect that plant if you have a deer issue. And I'm sure you all do, because we live in Nevada County. Um, let me think, okay, oh, I wanted to, yes? You know, I just heard, somebody came up, somebody just told me a week ago that they have the perfect deer de de deterrent. They take the ivory soap and they hang it on a string. Have you ever heard that? Does yes. It work? She said that her friend has a perfect deer deterrent that it's ivory soap hung on a string. Dial soap works better or Irish spring. They don't like that perfumey smell. I've taken garlic. I have a garlic smasher and put garlic onto um, pantyhose. Another great use for pantyhose. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, 30 years of teaching. I had quite a supply, believe me. and <laughs> I don't wear them anymore. Yeah, I smear that on there. They don't like garlic. You can buy these little vials. They're made uh, in a company out of Mount Shasta. I can't remember the name of them, but they're about shaped like a little test tube, and they have a little garlic insert in them. Those things work really, really well. Okay. Yeah. The soap, I would not depend on it. No. Mm -mm. no. Not really. I've used cayenne and everything. And yeah. Yeah, a lot of people uh, have used blood meal. If you put it around the perimeter of your bed, they don't like the smell of it. Unfortunately, the raccoons do, and the bears. So, you know, you have to be careful about that or you'll attract bears to your property. And we don't... I'd rather have deer. I'd rather have deer. Yes? I, I hang the plastic Christmas ornaments on fishing line, and they don't like things that are moving that have sparkle. Yeah, Lori hangs uh, plastic shiny sparkly Christmas ornaments. How pretty. Yeah. I bet it keeps the birds away too. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with this. This is the Western Nevada County Gardening Guide. If you garden and you don't have it, you're missing out. It's $30. Oh, she's got hers right there on her lap. Yeah, and the, most of the information about cool season veggies is in here. Uh, this is our latest issue. It came out in 2010. Um, it's just an incredible information of things to help you be a better gardener in Nevada County. We're very proud of this book. Um, we worked really hard on it, and it's just loaded with good information. And places for notes. And places for notes. Yeah, the back end of it has what to do each month, month by month garden tasks, which will really help you be a better gardener and you can take notes in it. It also at the back has a lot of resources and it t this is all pest notes from the IPM wor workshop, I mean, pardon me, web website. Okay, something else I wanna put a bug in your ear about. How's my time doing here? Okay, cool. I wanna talk to you about mycorrhizae. Mycorrhizae, do you know my mycorrhizae somewhat? Um, I did a presentation Monday night at uh, the beekeepers and after the presentation this old guy came up to me who used to be in the Forest Service in Oregon and he had to tell me his mycorrhizae story and I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, they first discovered it in the 80s and they didn't know what it was because of all this white webbing going through the forest about eight inches under the tops of the soil. What mycorrhizae does is set up a symbiotic relationship between the root of a plant and the soil. It, it, it enhances the root system. In fact, I've got a, we are out of this other, well, this product right here. This is called Thrive. These are pretty similar, just different products, and we'll have uh, a couple of more of them in here because it's kind of the latest thing. I don't know if you can see this very well, but you see the one on the right is treated. Look how big that root system is. The one on the left was not treated. I, see the difference in the roots and the plants? I myself, when we first got this product in, um, year before last, I guess, yeah, we were given samples of it. I planted a row of, of uh, lettuce 
and about two feet away I planted another row of lettuce. The one on the left I watered with the Thrive, which is filled with microenzymes. That's what all this is. The one on the left within two weeks was twice the size of the one on the right. I took one of the plants out gently on both rows. The one that I had treated looked just like that picture. The root mass was huge. What it does, it sends out these little thin hair-like roots and it just better enables the plant to go through the soil and pull out the necessary nutrients for it. So this is something you want to, want to start adding to your garden. This is pricey. This is not so pricey. This is a lot though in this little container and I think it's what, yeah, it's $40 for this. And what is this one, 10? But you're gonna be hearing a lot about micronutrients and these are really, really valuable because they really help the plant and they make the plant healthy, they make the plant stronger. You have to water less when you have these because those roots are doing the work for you. Okay, any questions? Will you be teaching a class on composting? Yes, actually, uh, I'm doing a class on composting and making compost tea, and I think that's going to be in early April. Yeah, my next classes coming up are uh, Sunday is going to be going into NPK in more depth so that I can make your eyes glaze over. And the next class, that's Sunday at 4 o'clock here in the nursery. And then Wednesday the 20th, I'm doing planting a pollinator garden. Real important to have those pollinators in your yard. And I'm not just talking about honeybees. We have so many native uh, pollinators. Anything that flies into a flower and flies out and goes to another flower, is a pollinator and most of them are not aggressive when we think of things flying around we think of wasps they are aggressive uh, meat bees can be aggressive but the rest of them are very just solitary they just go about their business and they are vital to your garden and your yard I had an elderly couple come in um, last week complaining that they had planted fruit trees seven years ago and didn't have one piece of fruit on any of the trees I looked at the old guy, and he was old, older than me, so he's old. And I said, um, do you have any pollinators? And they're like, what are pollinators? And I'm like, whoa, really? Okay, uh, how can I do this gently? I said, um, do you use uh, a weed killer? She's like, oh my gosh, he's out there in that orchard all the time killing those weeds. I said, well, he's killing his pollinators, and you're not going to have any fruit unless you have pollinators. I had explained the what pollinators do. Uh, they were not real understanding about it, but I think they left with a little, maybe a tiny glimmer of why they need pollinators, because he was ready to cut the trees down. And um, I said, you know, you just can't be out there using glyphosate randomly and not, and not expect to do harm to your garden. Well, I have a question. Sure. We have a row of plum trees, beautiful blossoms, the buzzing you can hear 20 feet away at least, and um, we haven't had plums for like three years. How big are the trees? Really big. Mm, okay. Weather related. If it rains on the wrong time or freezes at the wrong time, it will yeah. kill the blossoms. Yeah, I have a peach tree. I have a peach tree. Uh, I've lived in this house eight years. The peach tree is nine years old. I've had ten peaches that whole time because the blossoms will set, just as he said, the blossoms will start setting the fruit, we'll get a freeze in, kills the blossoms, takes care of that. Or the fruit could be forming and it'll freeze and they'll just drop off because they're little tiny little bud-like things. Yeah, so it could be that. Do they get water? Um, nature's water. It could be also that. It could be a really hot, dry place and maybe late in the, su in the season it doesn't get enough water. So you think about fruit, fruit is, you know, like 70% water. Yeah, so you might need to do the water. You might need to put soft rock phosphate around, although that age of a tree, you're not going to be able to get the nutrients down into the feeder roots. Although most tr trees feed off about the first 12 inches of soil. So you might try pho soft rock phosphate. Well, would it have all those blossoms mm -hmm. if it didn't have enough soft rocks? No, no. So I imagine it's what's happening is just the weather. It's more weather yeah, it's like my peach tree. Because the last couple of years, it seems like 
there's been a frost or a hard wind, rain, just about the time things are setting. Yep. I mean, it's just been almost. Yep. Like, yeah, Indeed. I had some pluots the last couple of years. I mean, just full of blossoms, yeah. full of bees. But then, it, but nothing. Rain or cold, I may get one or two. Yeah, there's so many variables. It's just really hard to determine. Any more questions? Yes, ma'am. In last summer, in the bed, um, the upraised bed, I had peppers, and the leaves started curling. This might be an NPK question. <laughs> The leaves started curling and then brown spots on the peppers. What would that indicate? That could be a watering issue. Too much? Well, unfortunately, the symptoms of overwatering are the same as underwatering. <laughs> Probably, over. <laughs> Probably over. Now, peppers like to be dry. If you think of peppers, think of New Mexico, okay. where it's hot and dry. I don't water my peppers until they tell me they need to be watered. When I go out in the afternoon and they look a little... I'm like, oh, you poor babies. Okay, here comes the water. And, you know, next morning they're fine. And I have prolific peppers. Yeah, so don't overwater them and just water them when they tell you they need it. Let them dry out. A lot of plants need that drying out period because what that does is help them breathe. If you think about they breathe through their roots and if it's wet all the time, how can they breathe? So things need to dry out in between times. Like my tomatoes. I probably water my tomatoes once a week, very deeply. I water by hand. I just lay my little drip thing out there, my little, you know, I have a little sprinkler that kind of goes like that. I'll just put it under each plant and uh, go off and weed and, you know, check for insects and then move it like every 30 minutes. So, yeah, I don't water all the time. I don't water a lot, actually, in the summer, even though my bill looks like I do, <laughs> looks like I could flood the valley when it comes up to me. <laughs> yeah, really crazy. Yes? Arugula. Arugula. Winter cool climate. season. Uh, when the weather warms up a little bit. Again, we're having this cold spell, so it's brought the soil temperature down. But arugula is a cool season vegetable. Uh, I plant mine between my onions because it helps keep the weeds down and they don't com compete because onions go deep mm -hmm. and arugula is just right on the top. Have you ever had it stir fried? I read it all the time. Oh, I love it. I love it stir fry. That's why I want to grow it. Yeah, and it's so easy to grow. But again, it's a very cool season plant, and it will bolt to seed immediately when the weather gets hot. Okay, now we're a little lower. Um, what elevation are you? About 600 feet. Wow, okay. Yeah, you should have it planted now. So I can plant it now. Plant it now, yeah. And uh, arugula likes a lot of water, but what you can do, you can make like a sunscreen, uh, get shade cloth and put over it. Mm -hmm. And that will help it stay in the shade and just get enough light to grow by. Arugula is one of those veggies that will also grow in like uh, three hours of sun. So it, I could even put it in a pot um, up where I've got my other herbs. Mm -hmm. More like up on a yeah. area that gets just morning sun. Yeah. And yeah. then goes to shade in the afternoon. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I planted mine too late last year. I didn't get any. It just went okay. to seed. Yes? Last year, to make more garden space, we used some wine barrels cut in half. And didn't have a lot of luck. And I don't know if it's where they were placed or if you heard that for some reason, you know, the oak leaches something nope. down. Nope, it doesn't. Know great luck with wine barrels, mm -hmm. particularly for things like herbs. I have basil coming out of my ears, but it had to be in an area. We had to move the barrel because it was getting too much sun. I wondered Got if it, it was... into an area that had some morning sun, but afternoon, afternoon shade. shade. Yeah, basil likes afternoon get shade. Hot, I think if they're getting a lot of sun, they're smaller, so... Might have dried out more. Yeah. You have to give it a little more water. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, because that oak is porous. I use these, uh, we have 25 gallon black plastic pots that are so big. I use those. Mm -hmm. So is there a certain number of inches of dirt that you need to have in your raised beds? That depends on what you're growing. Some are very shallow rooted like arugula. Tomatoes have a foot and a half of a root. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I should bring that. I should have that here. I have it listed for how deep 
some root things are. Yeah, tomatoes are the deepest rooted They're growing. Deepest, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned arugula. I love it, but I never thought of planting it. So it's easy it's to saying, grow. So if, if I, we're here though in Grass Valley, so obviously the, the soil temperature is too. It's too cold, cold to start. So for start. Any other questions? Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. You're very yeah. welcome. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. It's always my pleasure. Too. We'll be seeing a lot more of Lynn Muth on the Food and Farm Show in future episodes as she presents other workshops guaranteed to give you information on your gardening. Time for our second break of the day, though. And when we come back, we'll be speaking with Briar Patch Manager Chris Mayer and also head up to North San Juan and learn all about Felix Gillet. You're watching the Food and Farm Show right here on the Touchdown Productions Network. Briar Patch Co-op Natural Foods Community Market offers organic produce from over 30 local and regional farms and buys organic produce throughout the year from River Hill, Four Frog, Sweet Roots, Johansson, and Naked Farms. You can trust the patch to hold their producers to the highest standards and always be certified organic. So get to the patch, the Briar Patch, for organic produce. Spring is here. Time to visit the garden center at A to Z Supply. We have everything you need to plant it, grow it, preserve it, and eat it. With a master gardener and full full-time beekeepers on staff, the garden center carries a wide selection of organic plants, along with people and pet friendly products. And don't forget our weekly workshops at the Garden Center at A to Z Supply. Introducing Cuvée Leather Kitchenware. Kitchenware that lasts a lifetime. Made from genuine leather suede, Cuvée Kitchenware comes in a variety of colors and has been featured on the Food Network. Leather is the perfect kitchenware. It is a natural insulator, washable, and non-flammable. Cuvée, leather kitchenware, chefware, and tableware. Unique kitchenware to complement your favorite place. Create, entertain, and be you. Anything Green Hydroponics is your source for hydro systems, grow lights, and soils. Anything Green offers a complete range of organic nutrients as well as fungicides, miticides, and predatory bugs. Don't forget the Anything Green Propagation Workshop on Saturday, March 30th from 1 to 2 p.m. Learn how to propagate seed, cutting, and grafting. It's all at Anything Green Hydroponics. A couple of weeks ago, the Food and Farm Show was up at North San Juan for their Farmer Seed Swap. This is an annual event up there where farmers come together, tell the stories of their seeds, and then give them to each other so they can grow sustainable crops up in that area. Besides the seed swap, though, there was workshops going on. One of them was a very interesting one about a Frenchman who came to Nevada County in 1872. His name was Felix Gillet and he changed the course of agriculture here in Nevada County. Adam from the Felix Gillet Institute picks up the story. 1868, 1868, in 69, he bought his first property for the, um, for Barren Hill Nursery. And uh, he was a barber for 10 years. And that's how he made some of his money. Some of it speculated, he also made some of his money from gold. And he bought his first 16 acres right on Nursery Street. And then he invested what is the equivalent of $50,000 in scion wood and plant material from France. We don't know which nurseries he got them from. He doesn't, we don't know how they got here. But we do know from his catalogs from uh, 1869 to 1908 that the amount that he grew, the varieties he grew, um, the legacy he left is absolutely incredible. I mean, he grew anything from Walnuts, almonds, pears, apricot, peaches, plums, gooseberries. He had 55 varieties of gooseberries. In one catalog, he had 241 varieties of grapes. And so when you look at these varieties and you look at what's grown now, a majority of what is grown now in the Northwest and California, the earliest record that we know are from these catalogs. We've been to the wine industry, the prune industry, the filbert industry, the walnut industry, 
they all recognize Felix Gillet, some of the founding fathers of bringing this, this here. If, you eat, if you've eaten a colossal chestnut, that was bred from the Felix Gillet variety. If you've, if you've ever eaten a hazelnut, the Barcelona is the most popular in Oregon, that was brought by Felix Gillet. Um, the, Bing cherry. the Bing cherry claimed the fame. The Thompson seedless. I mean, it, it just goes on and on. Um, he had uh, the Franquette walnut he brought out here, um, which the walnut industry now names one called the Felix Gillet, um, in honor of Felix Gillet. And so what we've done is part of this is researching his history and what he's left us. Um, so we're in the process right now. We're going through all of his old catalogs, which are still in his house in Nevada City. You can actually go by there on, on the, um, Nursery Street. There's a little plaque out there dedicated to him. Right there on his property is what we think is his favorite pair, the Bray Claire Go. Um, you know, amongst other things, there's a purple-leafed uh, filbert. Uh, and then uh, there's a lot of other things in the area, such as conifers. After he had died, um, Parsons took over and he changed it to the Felix Gillet Nursery, um, which he then propagated all of Felix Gillet's and then included a lot of ornamentals and kept that going. And when that was going on, it was the second longest running nursery in California. Um, after Parsons uh, died and, and the parcel was split up, it was split up into housing, and of course the nursery just got spread out all over the place. And the only thing that we know about him now is through the catalogs that we get to investigate, the articles he wrote, the articles written about him, and then the obvious fruit trees that are all around here. Um, you know, in Nevada City, he played an important role as well. He was um, part of the board that um, was the precursor to the food and, dr um, food and agricultural department. He was part of the, the, he was elected twice to the Nevada City um, town uh, trustees. Um, he was, uh, he helped implement the water system in Nevada City. So he was a real player in the politics and um, in the horticultural society around the gold mining time. And so, uh, like I said, this year was the first time we've actually had a catalog out. We sold out all of our trees this year. Everything that we had, we, we got rid of them all. People are just hungry for this, and it's a real beautiful thing. And there's actually some scion wood that's up there. If any of you know how to graft, or if you're interested, you can find YouTube videos. If you have an old fruit tree on your property, you grab a few varieties if you want to and try to graft them on there. Um, and uh, you can be a part of it. And so a lot of the places that we found are from people who told us where these orchards are. Or on their property, they have these old pears, or they have these old mulberries, or these old cherries. And so we encourage people to get in touch with, in touch with us um, if you know of, or if you um, maybe even want to find out what kind of varieties, old varieties you might have on your property. So uh, that's what we're doing a lot, and it's spending a lot of our time doing that. Um, yeah, so we're going to continue doing this next year. We're going to have a lot of the same varieties plus more. This year, I think we're up to like 40 or 50 varieties of apples, uh, more than a dozen pears, uh, half dozen cherries, uh, almonds. Um, and we're just going to keep rolling with this. And uh, the more the community participates, the bigger this is going to grow. And the reason why this is so important is, um, as you know, that we're facing a lot of shifts politically and socially in our lives right now. Um, along with uh, the, the patenting of life, um, intellectual property, monoculture, a lot of our food is being destroyed. Our food web is being taken away from us. And it's important that we, this is just a small part, but it's important that we all participate in our own food web and we support ourselves. That we take heed to these heirloom fruit trees um, and the seeds that Sierra Seed Co-ops is growing. These fruit trees, for instance, they're over 100 years old, little or no care, grown at high altitudes such as forest and pike, rocky clay soil, and they're producing an abundance of food. This is superior genetics and a testament to Jalay's skill and insight into his nursery abilities. And so if we all participate, we can continue this growing and grow awareness of what food is and what food is to us. It's our cultural heritage, it's who we are. It's our horticultural heritage and it's literally being taken away from us. It's literally being patented it's being taken and it's, it's being marginalized. Most of our varieties have already, like 90% of the heirloom varieties are, are now extinct. They're, they're done for because these industries have taken these up. And so now what you need to do is find the most important of these varieties, the most hardy, the most delicious, and keep them going for ourselves and our posterity. So I encourage all of you to do what you can and participate in whatever way you can, whether it's just 
buying at the grocery, the uh, organic at the farmer's market, or uh, growing out trees or vegetables or seeds or volunteering or anything you can do, just because it really is that important. And uh, I want to thank you guys for being here. The Briar Patch Co-op has become a vital player in the growing food movement here in Nevada County. Gil Dominguez had a chance to catch up with the manager, Chris Mayer, and we're going to learn a little bit about Briar Patch Co-op and what a food co-op is about. Thanks, Cheryl. As we were saying earlier in the program, Briar Patch Community Co-op has grown to become one of the largest in the country and certainly the only one in Nevada County. So as we learn more about co-ops, let's bring in Chris Mayer, the general manager of Briar Patch. Chris, thanks a lot. Welcome for being on the Food and Farm Show. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Well, it's so interesting when you look at what co-ops are and, and how lucky we are to have one right here in our own community. It sure is, and it's a great business model and contributes a lot back to the local community, not just the food, but the impact of the uh, local business, the local jobs. Um, it's, a lot of, it's a great thing. Now, we're here in the produce section, and I had to think that uh, the first early co-ops dealt with food only. That's true. The uh, cooperative movement dates back to the 1840s in Rochdale, England, and uh, were formed to bring good quality food to a group of weavers um, that were dealing with the changes of post uh, or pre-industrial society at that time. And then they banded together just to, so they could all have the same amount of food. I would imagine back in the, uh, the caveman days, there was some clan together where they all killed the wildebeest and brought it in and shared it as well. Sure, cooperation has probably existed as long as people have been hungry. <laughs> now, this particular one right here, what's the, the history of that? When did it get started? Uh, Briar Patch was formed in 1976 by uh, a group of friends who uh, wanted to bring organic and natural foods to this area and didn't have access. So they began buying um, common staple items like beans and rice in bulk. It started in uh, our founding member David Bowman's garage. And before too long, they needed a retail operation, a location to um, receive and distribute the foods that they were buying. And uh, now we are in our fifth location almost 40 years later and it has done nothing but grow since then. Now that's a fabulous story. Along the way, was there other food co-ops that tried to make a start here in Nevada County? I'm not aware of any that were in Nevada County, but I know that there are other co-ops in the area. Of course, Sacramento Natural Foods is successful uh, down in that area and um, the Davis Food Co-op as well as a co-op that existed in South Lake Tahoe for a period of time in the 70s. Now the concept of the co-op being just food or produce or from the farm uh, has really taken off here at this particular market uh, where now it's everything from uh, toothpaste to cereals to uh, uh, other products like that. How did that transformation occur? That's in response to member needs. Um, people have you know, told us what they want to see in their store. When we were designing this particular location, it was clear that people were looking for as close to a one-stop shopping experience as they could get. And that was when we added a full-service uh, fresh meat department, focuses on local meats. Um, and organic meats as well as uh, sustainably harvested seafood and uh, we also added our food service operation so we're selling prepared ready to go foods for people who um, don't or can't cook for themselves or just need lunch. <laughs> well I noticed yesterday when we were uh, here that the lunchtime crowd was business was pretty brisk with people grabbing their lunch uh, knowing that and, and enjoying the beautiful patio outside. Yeah definitely it's one of the um, places where people get introduced to the co-op. Maybe people don't have a full knowledge of what organics is or what local is or um, the types of foods that we sell here and they come um, just to get a, a sandwich or a salad at the deli and then they learn about Briar Patch and everything that we have to offer. Now your particular history with the store goes back to 2008-2009. Uh, that's right. I was originally hired to start the food service operation. I was the deli manager. I had been working at a co-op uh, in New Mexico prior to coming to Nevada County and was hired into that position and became the general manager a couple years later. Now, what was that transformation like for you? Was that something obviously you were aspiring to or the opening just happened and you jumped in? or? Sure, it was, it was an amazing opportunity. It was a great opportunity to come to California. This is where my wife is from, so we had sought to uh, 
to move back here and this job was offered, um, the, job, the food service job, and um, got into that and uh, just was real passionate about co-ops and about the food, so um, it was a natural progression for me. So when you were at the, the deli, then you were part of the planning process for this particular store, and uh, what was that like? What was the excitement level there uh, when this new store was about to open? Oh, it was huge. On our preview night for our owners, um, we had nearly a thousand people show up and, and check us out that first night, May 31st. We opened to the public June 1st and immediately beat our expectations, our projections for what the store was going to do. We hit our 10-year projection in our fifth year of operations. So, so the parking issue that first night with a thousand people, the parking was already an issue. <laughs> it sure was. I think they were just stopped on Sierra College Drive and getting out of their cars like uh, like it was Woodstock or something like that. <laughs> the Woodstock of food. Yeah. Now, you mentioned uh, Whole Foods down in Sacramento as another example of uh, a, a natural food store. Um, Whole Foods is in Roseville, but I what I referred to was the Sacramento Natural Foods, which is another co-op. Right. And now... This store has been so successful. What, what's the future plans? It, how big does Briar Patch really want to be? Is there a limit that they can uh, serve the amount of people? Is another location an option? Uh, things like that. There are a lot of different options, and really our job is to listen to our members' needs and figure out what they're asking us to do and respond uh, appropriately to those requests. So that could take the form of a second location, it could be uh, a food hub, or it could be just um, more services in this location. Now, you get your marching orders from the board of directors. Briar Patch has a board of directors. Uh, they're, they're elected, right? That's correct. There are, there's nine uh, directors who are elected, three seats annually by the uh, voting membership, uh, active members in the co-op. And I, and I think it's important for everybody to realize what the, what the mission statement is of that board of directors and, and how, what their focus is where they, you know, it, and then they transmit those instructions down to you as the general manager. That's correct. Our board operates under a system where they have stated ends policies, and um, those policies uh, direct me to make sure that the Briar Patch is working towards the goals of um, offering organic and natural foods, being a leader, leading business in the county, um, a leader among co-ops, um, offering fair and interesting jobs, um, growing the local food mo movement, and uh, being a successful business. Well, speaking of the local food movement, we're here in the um, produce section right now. Uh, how many farms are, are we working with right now? We have about 50 farms that we work uh, directly with where they're bringing their product to us directly from the farm. Wow, that's a lot of local, and it's, it's local and regional, right? That's correct. Our local definition is one of the most conservative among natural food stores in the country. We call local if it's within about 20 miles of the store. Regional is uh, up to 100 miles, 120 miles from the store. So it's a, it's a very conservative definition, but it brings in quite a healthy number of local farms and, uh, and great food. Well, 20 miles going east pretty much takes you to the border of Nevada County. Just about. Um, 20 miles uh, almost encompasses the entire county, not quite. Well, it's a fascinating story about co-ops, and it's uh, also fascinating that uh, the, this, uh, the demand continues. What's, what's, you said you already beat the 10-year projections, but, but how astounding is that? How surprising was that to you? For me, when I got here and saw what this county was made of, what type of people were here and what type of services were available, it wasn't too surprising at all. And I think that a lot of the people who had been involved in the co-op in particular, as they were planning, knew that the uh, success was going to be just amazing and uh, um, built the biggest store that they could. Well, they certainly did, and I know when it was in the planning stages, there was much talk about the architectural design and the eco-friendly footprint and, uh, you know, the floors and the tiles and the outside and everything. Uh, just a tremendous, uh, once again, cooperative between all the different parties and construction people here in the county to create this. Yeah, that's true. We were the first uh, LEED certified commercial building in the county. That's the leadership in uh, energy efficiency and design. And uh, it essentially means that the construction methods that were used are cutting edge as far as their um, uh, 
uh, mitigation of the potentially in, potential environmental impact that constructing a building can have. Um, so that was a big deal, and uh, the partnership that was built as far as working with uh, our local um, architects and uh, construction people has just been a, a partnership that's continued to, to this day. Well, it's a beautiful place. It's really become a social gathering point for lunch, for dinner. There's usually music outside on the patio provided by local artists. And, and really in its short history here, uh, I would have to say that it's just a community focal point. You got the community room that pe groups yep. take advantage of. Uh, it's really just a, a blessing and a true cooperative among everybody. Yeah, it sure is. I, I hope that there's a, a wide sense of the positive impact that we have as an organization. Um, the food that we're bringing here certainly being the biggest part of that, um, but as well as the uh, community giving that we do and the jobs that we provide for the community. Excellent. Well, listen, I know you're a busy guy, so thanks for spending a few moments here, uh, dragging him out of his office over here. But you have come over here to this because you guys have grown so much, the offices are actually not even in the building anymore. That's correct. My office and the marketing office and a few other ones are across the street um, on Lytton Drive and uh, just, a, just a stone's throw away. So I come over here multiple times a day and get to uh, interact with the customers and the staff very regularly. Right, and grab some lunch. I know I'm going over right now. Yesterday they had the chicken and rice soup. I love that. Yeah, you're a big fan of the soups. You've uh, mentioned those a few times. Um, <laughs> well, it was the potato last time, so yeah. just I'm a big soup guy. <laughs> sure. Well, I'm going to encourage you to uh, take the time to sample everything from our board affair. All right. I certainly <laughs> will. Chris Mayer, ladies and gentlemen, here from the Briar Patch Co-op. Chris, thanks so much. Thank you. It's time now for our weekly giveaway. Up for grabs this week is a DVD of the Polyface U workshop presented by Joel Salatin from the third annual Sustainable Food and Farm Conference. It contains all four hours of the Polyface U that you are sure to be inspired by. Be the third email at thefoodandfarmshow at gmail.com to win. Well, that's our show for today. Thanks for stopping by and spending some time with us here on the Food and Farm Show. And remember, you can catch us every week, Monday nights at 6.30 p.m. on NCTV Channel 11 and Sudden Link 16 and ACTV Channel 20 and also 24-7 on our YouTube channel, which is The Food and Farm Show. So that's it for now, and we'll see you next week at The Food and Farm Show. Bye. Be sure to join us each week right here on NCTV Channel 11 at 6.30 to 7.30. And of course on our YouTube channel, The Food and Farm Show.